morning. Good morning. There it is. There it is. Uh, could y'all please stand with me as we get ready to sing together? Uh, before we go, I'd just like to read this uh, section of Hebrews for us. Uh, Hebrews 12, starting at verse 1, it says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily in, entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith. Um, and so a fun fact for you about today, uh, 365 days ago today was our very, very first preview service. So I know some of you were probably here for that, some of you weren't. Um, but there was just something about that scripture that really, really spoke to me in a lot of different ways, but just the, the fact that we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, right? This, this unbelievable community that God has blessed us with, it j just, just in a year is crazy. And, and, and to see how God has continued to provide time and time again, and how we are called to run with perseverance and to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. And so as we worship together uh, today, it, my, my hope and my prayer for you would be that as easy as it is to think about maybe the really great or really bad week that you just had, or maybe the really great or really bad week that you have coming up, or whatever it may be, that we would just take this time of worship to begin to fix our eyes on Jesus, because he is the author, he is the perfecter, he is where our help, he is where our joy, he is where our peace comes from. And so let's just begin to kind of, let's, let's take a second, let's come before God and just prepare to just fix our eyes on him with the unbelievable community and family that he has blessed us with.
God who saves, one who is strong and mighty. Freedom is in his name. Open the gates of heaven, lift up a shout of praise. There is a lion roaring, Jesus the King of glory. There is a King of glory. There is a God who saves, one who is strong and mighty. Freedom is in his name. Open the gates of heaven, lift up a shout of praise. There is a lion roaring, Jesus the King of glory. There is a lion roaring, Jesus the King of glory. Hello everyone. Hello, it's on. Can you hear me? Oh, there it is. Are you trying to turn me off? Hello, my name is Connor. I swam here all the way from Hawaii. And in case you're wondering why our church looks like this, it's because it looks like this all the time. <laughs> no, kiddos, just next week we will be having a vacation Bible school, and it will be wonderful. How many kiddos, young and old, are looking forward to the vacation Bible school next week? <laughs> yes, yes, yes. So thank you to all the wonderful volunteers that set all this up. And this man, he's just nice shirt. He looks, he looks very good. Anyhow, <laughs> if you're first time here to Grace Bible Church, please scan the QR code up on a nice big screen. Fill out your family's info, and then you can meet the nice lady in the back. Back there, wave, everybody. She will give you a grand prize, and everything will be wonderful. Well, thank you. Welcome to Grace Bible Church. Please say hello to everybody. Say, say hi to somebody next to you. And, We'll let this nice band keep on jamming. Keep jamming. Steady when I'm you. 
God, our lives, other people's lives in Scripture is riddled with examples of you doing that exact thing. You taking brokenness, you taking sin, and you turning it into something good and something beautiful. God, that's our life in a nutshell. God, that despite our sin, you still loved us and you still saved us, and we praise you for that. God, I pray that as we continue to dive into Proverbs God, and as we continue to chase after wisdom, God, that we would be willing to turn ourselves over to that, that we would be willing to say, I'm climbing this mountain with my hands wide open, and there's nothing I'm holding on to, because nothing that we can possibly hold on to that isn't you is worth. God, we love you, and we thank you so much for continuing to love us. For your sins, let me pray. All right, I want to invite our...
high school seniors to come make their way up to the side of the stage, and I'll call you up one at a time. So this is um, what we would really consider kind of one of the more bittersweet times as a church where uh, we're recognizing some high school seniors as they're getting ready for the next chapter in their life, whatever that is. And for some, um, it might very well be to stick around here. For others, um, it is they're, they're going off somewhere else. And this is essentially us sending them off almost as a missionary. So seniors, go ahead and make your way. We're, apparently we struggle with listening in school. <laughs> they made it. They graduated. It's all good. All right, make your way to this side if you wouldn't mind. All right. And so for us as a church, we're so new that um, really when we're seeing these, these guys, um, each of them have served a, a really pretty integral role for us here um, where, where you guys have been on the coffee team, right? And Ryan's been set up. And so they've been a part of the church since we, since we launched it and have been working faithfully. And so when we say we're sending them off, it's like we're sending off a big piece of who we are. And, um, and so it's going to be hard for us. But let me introduce, and then I'll, I'll kind of tell you what we do as a, as a church. Um, first is Nicholas Garza, and he plans to attend uh, Texas A&M San Antonio to study in computer science. Uh, next is Gabriela Salas, and she is headed to the work field and has a future plans of becoming a phlebotomist. And I have no idea what that is, but it's really cool. <laughs> Growing blood. Oh, dear. <laughs> practice. No, no, we're not going to practice. And uh, last is Ryan Tudell, and he plans to go to Texas Tech, my neck of the woods, where I grew up. And he's going in the fall, and he's going to major in animal science. And so... <laughs> So what we do as a church is we give, uh, we give bricks. And so I know you're like, what? All right. Um, on average, most churches give Bibles. But in America, especially in the South, the average household has up to anywhere from seven to ten Bibles in, in a house. And so I think you're, we're all good on Bibles. But what we do is we give bricks, and, and here's why. Um, because we want them to, to take this brick with them to wherever they go. And so the next place they go, whether it's a, a dorm room or a, it might be a house and it might be wherever it is, that you take that brick as a reminder of who God is and how he's brought you this far. And so for me, I've been uh, handing out bricks for about the last 10 years. And, um, and it's so cool to see where as students get off in life where they'll send pictures of, hey, they take a picture of their brick in their new house as they, they're starting a family. And they're taking that brick with them as a reminder of, hey, here's how far God has gone for us. Almost that Ebenezer stone. And so we hope you, you will take that as just a reminder of who God is and how he's been faithful as you go on to the, this next chapter that will lead to another chapter. But wherever you go, God has laid a foundation. And we've been pouring in for years to this foundation that, that Jesus is going to use you to do incredible things in all the places that you go. We're so proud and excited to see where y'all go. So let me pray for you. Dear Father God, we thank you for each of these seniors. God, and, and what, they, what they mean to us. Um, God, just seeing that their faithfulness where uh, you, you find a senior who's willing to come up and serve on, on a coffee team and a setup team and is here at a church at 7 a.m., because they're faithfully serving you. And God, we pray that you'll just continue to take that, that faithful servant mindset and, and that as they leave here and as they go on to their next chapter, God, that, that that will be the foundation that they build upon, is a foundation of faithful service to the Lord. And God, we pray for the places that they go. God, that, that you would already have... Um, a group of people that you are going to draw them into life with, where they will find a group of people that will uh, challenge them to, to be in church and to, and to get into the word and will challenge them in their faith and to continue in their faith. 
God, that you will find places for them to, uh, to plug into who live for the kingdom. And so, God, we pray that even as they go, that we know that uh, there's going to be times where they're going to struggle, they're going to fall, they're going to they're going to mess up. But God, keep reminding them of Your grace and Your mercy. That that any time they fall, that that You will gladly pick them back up and set them back on the way. So, God, help them to remember the foundation that they have in You. God, we, we pray your, your guiding hand will lead them every step of the way. Pray that in your name. Guys. All right, if you have your Bibles, uh, get them out. We're going to be in Proverbs uh, all over the place, actually. So Proverbs 18 is where we're going to start. Looking for tripping hazards before we get started. Proverbs 18, and we're continuing just a, a look at Proverbs, and, uh, and really, as we, as we look, you're going to find that the first uh, nine to ten chapters, um, there's a little bit more of an, an idea of where he's going, and then after like 10 to 31, you almost get this where uh, there's verse after verse where it just seems like a bunch of random, like, just throwing wisdom in there. And so what we're going to do is really we're going to try to piece together some verses all over Proverbs to, to get one framework for where we're looking this morning, where we want to build a framework for what we believe God is calling each of us to, a framework in friendship and community and godly friendship and godly community. And so we're going to piece together a little bit all over Proverbs to see what that might actually look like for us and to challenge us in that way. And so for us, I think um, when we think about relationships and community, it's kind of a challenge for us because we live in an age where we are far more connected than almost anybody at any point in history, where you could be connected with somebody on the other side of the world and, and have conversations and, and, and talk to people on the complete other side of the world just like that. Now, there was, a, there was a story that came out that, that kind of shows the danger in where we live. And so I don't know if you remember back in 2006, uh, there was a story that made headlines. And that was the story of uh, a lady named Joyce Vincent because she died. The, the story came out in 2006. And what made her death newsworthy was simply this. Uh, she died in 2003. And nobody knew about it until 2006. She went a little over two years, and nobody knew that she had passed away. It, it, it wasn't until the, the North London Housing Authority went to repossess her house because she hadn't been paying rent for two years that they discovered, they opened the door to find uh, the TV on, Christmas presents wrapped but not sent, uh, uh, dishes in the sink, and she's lying on the ground, and her body is mostly decomposed over the course of two years. And so that began to ask, really, the, the, when news broke, it was, how did this happen? How do we, how do we get to where, where something like this could happen? And so they said this in the Glasgow Herald. It says that her friends categorized her as someone who walked out of jobs if she clashed with a colleague. And so in other words, if things got really hard in the place that she worked, she would ghost them. Like, and so ghosting, and so if you're a, a little older, ghosting is you just stop showing up for work and never turn in your resignation, never give your two weeks. You just stop showing up and, and that's it. It's done. And so she was in the habit of ghosting her employers. And so nobody would have ever thought twice as far as an employee, employer goes, like, hey, let me check on what's going on with, with Joyce. Because they just assumed she was ghosting again. And so it says this, that she was one who moved from one flat to the next all over London. Never really laid down roots. Just going from place to place constantly. Then it would say this about her. She didn't answer the phone. Uh, to her sister or anyone in her family and didn't 
even really have her own circle of friends, even though it was friends that were giving them all this information, allegedly, right? But rather, she was relying on the company of relative strangers, where you never knew who she was going to hang out with at any one time. And so she had thousands of relationships. So in other words, we would say like this. She had uh, a mile of relationships, but they were all about an inch deep. And see, that, that's the danger for where we live, isn't it? Where it's easy for us to, to have a mile full of relationships that are an inch deep, rather than to have a couple of very significant deep relationships. And so many of us will default to that. Now, really, I think we kind of live in one of two extremes, if I'm honest, where for some of us, you're like, nope, that's not me. I, I'm, I'm good. I'm, I'm kind of to myself. I'm introverted. I'm not a people person. I don't really like to be around large groups of people. And so I even struggle to be in a room like this on a Sunday morning. And, and I'm good if I didn't interact with anybody at all. That's what some of us would say almost to the point where we're like, hey, like in Genesis 2, where God looks at Adam and goes, hey, it, it's not fit for him to be alone. And you would go, man, if that was me, God probably would have been like, oh, I guess this works. And there's some of us that are like that, to which Solomon would write this in Proverbs 18, verse 1. Whoever isolates him seeks his own desire, and he breaks out against all sound judgment. In other words, it's not good for you to be alone, to, to isolate yourself. Like, there's nothing wrong with being an introvert. But if you never have a relationship with anybody, that, that's what's not good for you. And then, like I said, there's others of us that will have a thousand relationships, much like Joyce did, but not have any one significant relationship. To which Solomon would write in verse 24, a man of many companions may come to ruin, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. A man of many companions who has a thousand relationships that are an inch deep may come to ruin. Because we have nobody who's doing really life with us. Like that, that's, that's the struggle of where we live. Now, let, let's make sure we, we, we don't miss really what Solomon says all over Proverbs is this idea. And really we see it all over um, the Bible period, Old Testament and New, is this one simple idea that we have to get around. It's this, that we were made for people. We were made for people. Or maybe to say it a different way, we were made for community. We were made for community. And so you can't isolate yourself, but you can't have many companions or it'll come to ruin and so he would actually say this, Proverbs 13, verse 20. Whoever walks with the wise becomes wise, but the companion of fools will suffer harm. And so though we were made for people and we were made for community, we also have to understand that he definitely tells us this. Who you surround yourself with matters. We were made for people but who you surround yourself with matters a great deal. Now, here's the truth. We all know this to be true, don't we? Because whenever we're getting ready to send our kids off for the very first time out into the school system or out into wherever, what is one of the first things we tell? Hey, be careful who you hang out with. Like seniors, as you go, like be careful who you, you go and, and, and make friends with in the places that you're at. Because who you make friends with is going to matter a great deal in forming who you become. Now, we would say this to our kids, but then what we do as adults is we kind of try to operate in a different way. Where we go, yeah, that's, that's good advice for kids, but that's not good advice for me. Where that's good for them, but it really doesn't apply to me anymore. Because I can hang out with whoever I want, 
and it won't influence because I, I am who I am now. Now, we would say that, but yet, here's what we see all the time, though. You go to one group of friends and you act one way, and then you go to another group of friends and you act a complete different way. And then you go to a complete different group of friends and you act a complete different way. Why? Because you're influenced in all those circles to act differently. It's never more evident than, than somebody who goes, like typically that you go, man I, I, man, I don't really cuss. I don't really use foul language, but then all of a sudden you find yourself around this group of people and that man, they're cussing like sailors. And so then you're like, oh, okay, I guess I'll do that. And so then you'll let a few fly and you won't think anything about it because they don't. But then all of a sudden you find yourself in, in a place where I'm at and then you accidentally let one fly and go, oh man, pastor, I'm so sorry I said that. Because we're letting who we're around influence who we are, Right? And how often do we, do we let that happen? And so as adults, we're just as susceptible as, as kids are. But we don't have the parent looking down on us to go, hey, you need to be careful who you're hanging out with. Right? That's the, that's the difference. We don't have that person speaking in and going, hey, that's not a good relationship. Because as a parent, we know, like, there's some people that, that your kids are wanting to hang out with and you're like, oh no, please do not hang out with them. And you're wanting them not to spend time with that person because like, hey, if they spend time with that person, then whew, who knows what's going to happen next. And so for some parents, we're, we're trying to pray our kids out of those relationships. And as adults, probably our parents might be praying the same thing over our lives, right? Trying to pray us out of certain relationships. Because of the influence that they're having over us. No different, right? Who you surround yourself with matters a great deal. Now, I think here's our struggle, though. It's who you surround yourself with matters. But our struggle is to have deep relationships takes a lot of work, doesn't it? Because to, to, to have godly friendships, it will take work. It will take a lot of work because the easy path is to have a bunch of shallow relationships that, that require little work. But to have some true godly friendships, it will take a lot of work. Like we look at and we think that, uh, that life operates like in Step Brothers, right? Anybody seen Step Brothers? Good movie, all right? All right? You like to laugh. Because there's that scene in there that, that we all love. Where you got these two grown men living with their parents and they're in the same room and they're lying down, they're trying to go to sleep and then they start saying what each other likes and then like they're going, oh, you like this? I like that. You like that? I like that. And so then after they do that back and forth for a little bit, they go, did we just become best friends? Yep. And so then they build bunk beds and they crash it down and you know, hurts the other, right? It's amazing. And we think that's how life works. But that's not how it works at all, is it? Like to, to, to have true godly friendships, it takes work. There's not, you're not going to accidentally fall into incredible deep relationships. You're going to have to invest time into these things. And that's, that's where we want to step off, isn't it? I've got to put in work. I'm, I'm out. But maybe... Whenever we don't want to put in work, we're missing out on the great gift that God would give us through godly friendship. That if we would press in and do the hard work, that on the other side of that, there's going to be something that is well worth it. There's going to be a relationship that challenges you and grows you that is well worth it. Now, here, let, let's, let's understand this. Now, last week, we talked about that... that with, that Jesus is God's wisdom, and so Jesus embodies wisdom. And so when, when uh, the New Testament people were reading Proverbs, they were reading Proverbs in light of Jesus. So when they read Proverbs, they were seeing how Jesus modeled all of these things. And so when we think of, okay, what does it look like to have a godly friendship? Well, shouldn't we look at how Jesus did friendships? 
and community. If Jesus is the model of wisdom, then let's look at how Jesus did it so that we could take notes so that we could do it better, right? So that we could do it like he did. That's, that's the idea. So how did Jesus model friendships for us? There's a few things that I want to bring out. Number one, Jesus models friendship for us in the way that he was intentional. Jesus was very intentional with every relationship that he was in. You would not have found anybody that was more intentional about relationships. Where Jesus is, is going through, and uh, nobody else could do this, where he's going through a town, and he sees a guy in a tree, calls him and says, hey, I'm going to come eat with you, invite your friends, and then boom, there's an intentional relationship that he is forming. Or then you just follow him and, and his relationship with his disciples. Right? Jesus was intentional with every action that he ever did with his disciples. Everything he said, everything he pushed them out to, everything he challenged them to, he was intentional with it. Now, are, are you intentional with the relationships that you're in? That's the question we, we've got to get around and ask ourselves. Are you intentional with the relationships that you're in? Because when we're talking about putting in work... That means you're being intentional in all these areas so that you can grow these relationships. Because I think a lot of us, we would go, oh man, we're going to play relationships real loosey. And go, oh, if we can't get together, it's not a big deal. Like, it's, it's, not that, it's not that big a deal. I'll just go through my life. Man, we might get together once every few months or even years and think, oh man, we've still got this great, healthy, thriving, deep relationship. But in reality, that it, it can't be, right? There must be some intentionality to grow that relationship. And so are, are you intentional with the relationships? No. We've got to be intentional with the right relationships, don't we? I, I think maybe some of our struggle is we're intentional with the wrong relationships. Why? Because they come easier because we don't want to be challenged. And so we're intentional with the wrong relationships, and God wants us to be intentional with the right relationships that are challenging us to be more like Him. So which one are you more intentional with? That, that's really what it is. That's what you've got to wrestle with. Which one are you being more intentional about growing and developing? Because there's one that the Lord would point to, and He would go, man, your greatest, most significant relationships in your life need to be with other believers who will challenge you to be more like Jesus. That, that's the reality that you have to get around this morning. Is that our deepest, most life-giving relationships that you spend more time in need to be relationships that are going to push you to be more like Jesus. That, that's what needs to be. So Jesus modeled intentionality for us, but then... Uh, he modeled empathy, where if we're going to have deep relationships, they have to be empathetic relationships. Where, here's the idea of empathy. It, it's shown in how much compassion and understanding we give to one another, where we will enter into someone's struggle. Right? So there's a difference here between uh, empathy and sympathy. We really love sympathy, because what is sympathy? Man, I, really, I feel really bad for you. Like, that's going on in your life. That is really hard. Man, I'm sorry that's, that's happening. I'll pray for you. Cool. That, that's sympathy. Empathy is going, man, I see where you're struggling. I see what's going on in your life. Now let me enter into it with you so that I can help you in the middle of it. That's, that's empathy. Now, Jesus was great at empathy, wasn't he? And he entered into people's Struggles, even when it wasn't how it was supposed to be. Where the woman at the well, who he was supposed to have nothing to do with, he enters into her struggle, meets her where she is, pulls her up out of it, right? See, that's what our relationships are supposed to look like. Like, if we're going to grow some deep, rooted, godly relationships then it is going to be built on empathy where we're going, hey, I love you, so I'm going to enter in to your struggle and not just leave you to it, and good luck. 
See, I, I've seen that model here over the last couple of months. Can I give you a couple of instances? There was, a, there was a guy who his sister passed away a couple of months ago. And so sympathy would say, hey, man, that sucks. I pray, I'm going to pray for you. Is there anything I can do? And then you kind of leave it at that. <coughs> Empathy was his group going, man, let's pack up on Saturday morning. Drive four and a half hours to the other side of Houston so that we can enter your, into your struggle and be at the, at the funeral with you so that you're not there by yourself. We're going to enter into it. And as soon as it's over, we're driving four and a half hours back on the same day. And we're in church the next day. I mean, it was, I, I could have prayed for it, but I went, I went beyond. Empathy is, and hey, I've got to go in for treatment. Sympathy would say, hey, I'll pray for you. I hope it, I hope it goes well. Empathy is going, that person who says, hey, I'm going to come and sit with you in the middle of it. I want to be there during it for you. Is that the kind of person you are? Or you're going, I want to enter into the struggles of my friends because, because I love them. And, and I want to lift them up as much as I can out of their struggle. Is that who you are? Because, man, isn't that what we need most of the time? But you're not going to get that if you, if you aren't that, right? Jesus modeled that for us. Then I think what else we can see from Jesus is he exhorts and challenges. He models friendship in the way that he exhorts and challenges the relationships that he has. Right? We see this with his disciples all the time. Where, where Jesus has to rebuke his disciples so often. Now, what we would have done most of the time, because we don't want the strain in a relationship, is we go, man, I'm not going to rebuke my friend. I'm just going to let him keep doing it, and hopefully he'll figure it out on his own. Right? That's not how Jesus was, was it? Jesus was going, oh, no, no, no. Let me, let me tell you, hey, you need to stop. Now, here's the perfect example. Matthew 16, verse 21 through 23, it says this. And from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. So he's telling his disciples, hey, here's the reality of what's coming my way. Now notice what Peter's response is. And it says, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, now, hold on, let's pause here. To rebuke Jesus, that's probably a bad idea, right? Can we all get on board with that? And so Peter goes, let me rebuke Jesus. And he says, far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. Like, hey, Jesus, I love you, and I'm not going to let this happen. I'm not going to let them take you and kill you. Which sounds really good. Like, we would go, as a friend, we would go, oh, man, that's sweet. Like, you love me, and you're going to fight for me, and you don't want me to die. Like, we can all get on board with, man, he, that's caring, isn't it? But notice what Jesus' response is. Verse 23, he says, But he turned and said to Peter what nobody in this room would ever want to hear from Jesus. Get behind me, Satan. Get behind me, Satan, is what he tells Peter. You are a hindrance to me, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but rather on the things of man. He says, get behind me, Satan. Why? Because you're trying to tempt me to not do what God's will is. So get behind me. I don't need you to, to tell me to do something that goes against God's work. Whew. Talk about, I wouldn't want to be Peter in that moment. But how many of us would have that conversation? Hey, hold on. You're telling me to do something that goes against God's work. I need you to stop. I need you to get behind me. But a good friend would do that, wouldn't they? In fact, Proverbs 29, he says this, verse 5 and 6, Better is open rebuke than hidden love. 
So better is the rebuke of a friend than a hidden love. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, and profuse are the kisses of an enemy. Like an enemy would never tell you something that would challenge you. But faithful are the wounds of a friend. Where a friend would come and tell you something that is, that is harsh, but you need to hear it. And it's a wound that you need to take. Why? Because it's a wound that will grow you. Then he would follow this up in verse 9, and he says this, Oil and perfume make a heart glad, and the sweetness of a friend comes from his earnest counsel. The sweetness of a friend comes from his earnest, honest counsel about what is going on in your life. Here's the question. Have you invited people into your life who can tell you things you don't want to hear? Have you invited people in to say the hard things? Because a good Christian friend will point out spiritual things that we can't see, such as sin and idolatry. And we need those friends that will point those things out in our life so that we can move past them and put them behind us. Right? That, that's what we need. A Christian friend won't tell us what we want to hear, but will rather tell us what we need to hear. I have a handful of guys who do this really well for me, and I was just meeting with one a couple of weeks ago, and just talking through some different circumstances that are going on, and he told me some stuff that I didn't want to hear, and I was like, bro, I hate you. And then we hugged, right? And I was like, man, I hate when you tell me what I don't want to hear. But that, that's what we need, isn't it? We need people who will tell us what we don't want to hear and who know our weaknesses. Who know where we struggle and, and, and so they can go, hey, I know you struggle here and so I know your temptation right here. Now let me challenge you in that. But have you given those people permission to do that and then make it sure that they've given you permission to do the same and that whatever is said we don't walk away, right? Because there's a level of trust, love that we have for one another. Are you growing that type of relationship? Okay, yeah, love. So we start off in Proverbs 18. It says this in Proverbs 18, 22. I think this is especially true of pastors. He says, he who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. Because how often has my wife come in and said something that I don't want to hear. <laughs> Hold on. Ugh. All right. And calls me out in, in ways that I don't want to be called out on, but she knows the struggles, right? Every, every good pastor needs that. But really, every husband and wife needs that. Where we go, hey, we're doing life, and we love, we love each other, so we wouldn't want to continue doing something that is contrary to what God would have us do. So let me give you permission, which should have happened the day you got married at the ceremony. He said, for better or worse. I'll let them call out the worse so that you can do better. And that's what it's supposed to look like. But then we need friends outside of that as well who will do the same and go, hey, I'm in this friendship for better or for worse. And in your worst, I'm going to call you out so that you can be better. But have you given that? Have you given that? Because in order to get that, and you've got to admit where you're struggling. And I think this is where we, where we come off of this, where we go, man, nobody can exhort and challenge me because I'm not going to let anybody in to see. And until we're open to admitting our struggles to, to a group of people, we will never be able to be challenged to be moved out of where we're at. Like, can I ask, how many of you have something that, that you need God to do right now, that there's a struggle in your life, that, that there's something, that you, a place that you need God to move in your life right now. How many would say that? If your hand's down, you liar. <laughs> we would 
would say that, but yet on a Sunday morning, how often does our prayer team never have anybody come up and, and ask for prayer? Because right? we don't want to admit where we're struggling, do we? To, to come up and go, hey, I need you to pray for me would be to go, hey, I need help in this area of my life. And if we're ever going to get to that point, that's what we got to move past. That we're all messed up. And we all need something that, that only Jesus can give. But he also gave us people to do life with. And so let's be okay with going, hey, we're all messed up. So let me come up and I need prayer in my mess up. And I need some people who will walk with me in the middle of my mess. So that on the other side, I'm not staying in my mess for very long. But have you given that? So Jesus models that exhortation and challenge. And even the encouragement. But then I think Jesus models forgiveness for us too, doesn't he? In his relationships, and Jesus models forgiveness. Because if you're going to have a relationship that does what we just talked about, there's going to be moments where you're going to be mad. There's going to be moments where when you're hearing something that you don't want to hear, where it's going to make you go, I don't like you right now. And then fleshly, you're going to go, man, I don't know if I can forgive you for that. Because we're all sinners trying to do life together. And so at some point, that is going to cause strife. And so we have to take Jesus' model for forgiveness and go, hey, and sometimes you've got to offer forgiveness and sometimes you need to ask for it, right? If we're going to maintain this, this, these healthy relationships, sometimes you got to offer it up and sometimes you got to ask for it. But a good, godly friendship is going to be founded in forgiveness where no matter what happens, I'm going to, I'm going to forgive you. We're going to keep you alive together. Like nobody modeled that better than Jesus. Where, where Jesus, after he goes to the cross and, and before he goes to the cross, all of his disciples, uh, pretty much all of them, abandoned him. And, and Peter, who was like, hey, man, I'm not going to let him uh, kill you, Jesus. He denies Jesus three times. And so then when Jesus raises from the dead, he comes and he's showing himself to the apostles. Right? And so then he finds himself on a lake shore. And Peter's out of the boat and he's fishing. And what happens? He's catching nothing. And so then Jesus calls from the, from the shore, hey, Put your nets on the other side. And so what does he do? He puts his nets on the other side. They get filled with fish. And he's like, hold on, this happened before. That's Jesus. And so then they go back to shore. And he's like, man, this is Jesus. And so then they have breakfast together. And this is how we know that Jesus is far better than we are. Because in the middle of breakfast, as they're coming to an end, then Jesus is going, hey, all right, now let's have a talk, Peter. Like, I know that if I was Jesus, how that talk probably would have gone, Right? Where if I was Jesus, it probably would have been like, hey, Jesus, or hey, Peter, man, you remember how you denied me three times? Yeah, I do. <laughs> so, uh, man, you remember how I was coming to save the world? Not you, though. Because we get, we get bitter, and we, we get vengeful. But Jesus, he goes like this. When they had finished breakfast, verse 15, John 21. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. So he said to him, feed my lambs. Then Jesus said a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything, and you know that I love you. So Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Three times. Peter denies Jesus three times, and Jesus reaffirms Hey, love me. And 
then he says this, Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted, but when you are old, you will stretch out your hands, and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. And this he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. And then he says this, And after saying this, he said to him, Follow me. Enter back into that relationship that we had before. That, that's where it all starts. Hey, follow me. Come into, enter into a deep relationship with me. And so Jesus, after Peter denies him three times, he isn't like, hey, see you later, Peter. There's other people I'm going to spend all my time with. He goes, follow me. Enter back into that relationship with me. That's, that's how Jesus operates. And is that how you operate with your friends? Proverbs 17, 17 would say this. A friend loves at all times. All times. And a brother is born for adversity. A friend loves at all times. Is that you? Because if you want this to be the type of friend that you are, and the type of friends that you draw in, you know how that happens. That only happens through Jesus. It's only through Jesus that we can be that type of friend to anybody. It's through his power and his transforming us from the inside out that we can become that kind of friend to, to the people that God wants us in relationship with. That's how it happens. But have you let Jesus come in to transform your life so that you can be that? that? That's where it all starts. And so that's where the question has to begin. Have you allowed Jesus to come in and transform your life so that you can be that? As the band makes their way, there's three things that I think... When we talk about what it looks like to have godly friendships and be in godly community, I think there's three key convictions that we must have if this is going to be true of us. Number one is this understanding and this conviction that Jesus alone can satisfy our deepest desires. That we need people who will enter and go, hey, let's understand that Jesus alone can satisfy our deepest desires. And so then, when we're trying to satisfy our desires and all these other things, we need some people, some friends who will go, no, that can only be satisfied in Jesus. And then we'll call that out and go, hey, you're trying to pursue satisfaction in this, and it's never going to happen. And so, stop. But how many of us will get on that understanding? And we'll be so convicted, hey, that this must be true. Man, that was true of Jesus, wasn't it? In every relationship, Jesus was fighting for this. Jesus never caves to anything less than himself. For the rich man who's finding his pleasure in his wealth, he calls him to, to give up. To give up his riches. Because that's what held his heart. For something greater. That was him. For the, for the prostitute. He says hey. Man, give up that. Trying to find your desire. And all these other people. Give that up and come, come back to me. And find that only in me. Everyone who was ever pursuing it. He called hey. Leave that behind and come find that in the only place you can, and that is in me. But do you have friends that will believe that and call that out in your life? But then I think the second thing that, that Jesus shows us is that his kingdom alone is worth living for. Is that conviction that there is only one life that is worth living for. So we need some people who will challenge us to live that life. Because it's easy to pursue all these other things that will end up getting us nowhere in life. 
But we need people who will go, hey, this is a life that is worth living. And so I see you pursuing this in your kids, and it's setting your kids up for failure. So stop pursuing that. Hey, your family is going all in this one direction, and that is not the direction of Jesus. And so y'all should stop doing that. But do you believe that enough where you can call that out in in the life of your friends? And then here's the third thing that must be true, is that I need people who will believe the same thing in my life. Is that you must go, I need people who believe those first two things are true and will live like those first two things are true and will challenge me like those first two things are true. Do you have those? And if you don't, will you pursue those? Because the the reality is, living that life is so hard. Is that Jesus pushes us to community for a reason because it is so hard to walk this life by ourselves. Man, it's, it's why if you watch those survival game, game shows, right, they're always going, hey, they're, they're always sitting them out in twos because the, the really the harder one is to do by yourself. Like if they send you out by yourself, it's a whole lot harder. But when they go in twos, it's, if you watch them, and when that one person gets taken out, they're like, I'm left here by myself. Because there, there's power when you're in community with somebody. There's value in helping get you where you're supposed to go. And take the, the best way I can could, I could show this. But I've said before, I'm trying to train for a marathon. And so my boys have kind of got in on where they're like asking, hey, can I come run with you? Which most of the time I'm like, no, because I'm, I'm about to run six miles. And I want you to die it, right? And so, but I want to do this because they want to do it. So I'm like, okay, so let's do this. And so I'll manipulate my workout and do a shorter distance. And so there was one night where Layton was like, hey, uh, man, can I go run with you? And I was like, sure, yeah. And so I trimmed my workout down from five miles to two. And so then I was like, okay, all right, let's, let's go. And, and I'm going to go at a lot slower pace. And so we were going about an 11-minute mile pace, something like that, not crazy, or at least I thought. And so then we made it through the first mile. And, man, if you know my, my middle son, he's a talker. And so, man, that first mile, man, he's just talking my head off, like just talking, talking, talking. And we make it to about one and a quarter, one and a half. That's the most quiet I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> and he was starting to struggle, so I'm like, all right, let's slow it down a little bit more. So we slow it down to about 12 minutes. And at one and a half, he's like, man, Dad, I don't know if I can do this. We're almost there. We make it to 1.75. And he's like, Dad, I'm done. I'm like, buddy, you, you, got, you got a quarter of a mile. And then, then you're going to hit the goal. Let's keep that. So he's like, okay, okay. We make it to 1.8. You know, Dad, I, I'm like, do 0.2. We make it to 1.9. He's like, Dad, seriously, I'm about to die. I'm like, dude. Yeah, got to point this literally to that light. All we got to do is get to that light. And so we keep going. And so 1.95, he's like, down, down. I'm like, no, 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 0.5. It's literally, literally there. And the second we hit that two mile, man, he just throws up everywhere. <laughs> and so then I celebrate like you just won the Olympics. I'm like, oh, hey, great job. You did it, right? But if it was up to him, he would have stopped at 1.5. Wouldn't he? Here's, here's what I found out with this instrument. It's, it's all my game. Right? I, I, I ran seven miles yesterday, and at three, I was like, I'm done. But I knew if I started walking, that I would never make it to seven. And so I just pushed through it, and then I went seven like it was that. But how much harder was it to do that when it was by myself? And so with my son, it was like, hey, no, 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 come on. We're almost there. We're almost there. And how many of us 
We're, we're on that race. We're trying to get to Jesus. And then, man, there's going to become times where it's going to get really hard. And you're going, okay, I'm out. I'm done. And that's where you need that person to come in and go, hey, no, no, no. No, we're almost there. Just keep going. Just keep pushing. Let's keep running. Let's keep going. Because you see the finish line. We you see the finish line. Let's keep going to the finish line. And we need that person who will come in and go, okay, I'm committed to getting to the finish line with you. So come with me. Now, do you have that person who's committed to getting to the finish line with you? And who you can go, come with me. And I'm going to make sure that you don't stop and you don't veer off. I'm going to make sure you're getting to that finish line with me. Now, Jesus, he did that for us. And then he's going, now I need you to be that for, for people so that we can have a finish line faith. Now, will you be that? Will you enter into that? Because it's easy to, to be a Joyce Vincent that has no real relationship. much harder it is to be a friend like Jesus, but how much more valuable it is to be that, to have that, so that we can get to the finish line, faith. The prayer team comes up and challenges us with this as we pray. The prayer team, make the way of us pray. Maybe for, for some of us, we need to really think this morning, man, do I have it or am I that? Do I, do I have that and, and am I that? But what would it look like for you to, to be intentional with growing those relationships that are going to help lead me to Jesus?
the breath in our lungs, um, the joy that we feel on a day-to-day basis. Lord, everything comes from you, and apart from you, we can do nothing. God, we thank you that you are the ultimate picture of what a friend should look like. And God, we just pray this morning, Lord, that um, as we hear the message this morning, that we would learn from you what it means to be a friend to others, Lord. We thank you for the community that you have surrounded us with, Lord, and we just pray that you would make us friends who uh, spur each other on towards greatness and towards you. Lord, we love you and we praise you and we give you all the glory and honor in this place this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We are so glad y'all are here with us this morning. I'm going to have two quick announcements and then we'll be dismissed, as you can tell, and Kona let us know. VBS is happening this week, tomorrow, so if you're able, right after the service, we're going to transform this school into a scuba under the sea adventure for these kids. So if you can stay and help us decorate, we would love that. Back there in the corner, we have lunch. So grab a sandwich, chips, and a cookie. You can eat um, either in that back room over there or out here. We'll eat lunch, and then we'll go decorate together. Also, I wanted to point out, we have a church center app. Um, we have a slide for it. We don't always talk about it a lot, but Jeff was talking about groups. We talk a lot about getting plugged into community to serving. This app is a great way to do that. It says everything you need on there, groups, events, um, giving, serving, anything you can access through that church center app. Just um, download the app and then look up Grace Bible Church and you'll find us. Um, if you would like to give today, you can do so in three ways, through the church center app, the website, or the box on your way out. Thank you guys for being here, and we'll see you all next Sunday.